Hey everybody, it's me again. I wanted to put together a quick video to discuss uh, in particular energy and uh, the nature of growth in the production of resources such as energy and uh, other resources that might come from the ground like iron ore, gold, silver, oil, coal. Um, let's let's uh, open up this discussion with the three main types of growth that are uh, typically used to characterize phenomena that we see uh, in nature. The first is a straightforward exponential growth. We see this uh, in the money supply, for example, uh, rates of chemical reaction, uh, you know, as temperatures increase, rates of reaction tend to go up. Um, we also, you know, see other biological processes start off with exponential growth um, before they run out of uh, resources and become constrained. Um, that leads us to the second type of growth that we would typically see, which is an S-shaped type curve, which is a biologic or renewable resource type of growth curve. This type of growth curve can characterize um, things like uh, the, you know, the growth of biological species like rabbits, uh, deer, plant life, and typically it, it characterizes things that live in a finite world but can renew themselves. So for example, a predator-prey model, you might see the, uh, the growth in a species of wolf in a particular area increase very rapidly if food is abundant. And then as food becomes less and less abundant, the rate of increase in the population of uh, wolf may uh, tail off and level out. Then there's the third type of growth, which I think us resource investors are mainly interested in, which is the non-renewable resource uh, type of growth pattern, where it starts off with the discovery of a deposit somewhere, and as workers begin to erect capital equipment to extract the resources, the uh, rate of increase in production uh, goes up fairly quickly, and um, yeah, the uh, easy to get stuff, for example, surface coal is mined first, and then uh, you know, as you get deeper and deeper into the ground, the resources become a little bit more expensive and eventually get to a point where they're very difficult or non-economic to pull out, at which point production starts to trail off. Now, the production rate doesn't really go down to zero instantaneously. It just, you know, the rate of extraction of that resource goes down. So we can see this in things like uh, world oil production, coal production, uh, the rate of harvesting of woodlands, for example, back in uh, England, back in the 1800s, um, and other resources. So with that in mind, let's move on. Um, and let's talk about world population. This is an interesting graph I, I pulled from several different sources. You know, uh, an atlas, there was a United Nations population study. Uh, we also have data from the U.S. Census Bureau that, that can be used to fill in some of this. But you'll note that for a long period of history, up until about the year 1800, the rate of population growth in the United States was very, or not in the United States, but in the world was very low. It was actually about 0.1% per year, which corresponds to a doubling in population about every 700 years. So for a long time in our history, um, you know, the human race actually grew at a very, very slow rate. And then uh, you, you can see this typical exponential curve type hockey stick phenomena, which you know, started at about the year 1800, where the rate of growth in population actually increased quite substantially from this 0.1% per year to 1.3% per year. So we went from the population of the world doubling every 700 years to the population of the world doubling every 54 years, which is <laughs> quite a drastic uh, increase in the rate of growth of population. And what can be attributed to this is the um, abundance of fossil fuel. So back in the 1800s, that's when coal started to uh, be mined uh, pretty prodigiously. And in about eight, the year 1850, we started pulling uh, liquid oil out of the ground, uh, starting with spindle top in the U.S. And as a result of cheap and abundant energy, we've been able to do things like uh, you know, use uh, fossil fertilizers for food and produce a lot more food to support the, uh, you know, the, the world population and the, the rate of growth took off uh, quite spectacularly. Now, this is uh, clearly exponential. Whether or not it's sustainable, I, I particularly doubt it. I think we're going to be leveling off once we get beyond about 7 billion people on the, the face of the Earth. I think the rate of growth is going to start to tail off, and we'll get to a point where the Earth will have maybe 12 billion people, but I doubt that we're going to have the resources to support more than that. Um, so let's, let's talk about... Uh, oil and coal. 
So we mentioned that uh, oil and coal were largely responsible for the rapid increase in the, uh, the, the growth rate of the world population. So the rate of production of coal and oil should be of particular interest to us. So you can see that back in the year 1850, we started producing coal. And in the year 1900, we started producing significant amounts of oil. And the, uh, the rates of increase of these um, have, have been going up. And these do uh, look like exponential curves. Now, when we combine the two in terms of the total amount of energy available from both sources, we can see that uh, we've never been producing as much fossil energy as we have been in the past, say, five or ten years. Um, you know, it's been going up and up and up. Um, but one thing that we do know about resources that we pull out of the ground is that they're finite. You know, you discover a certain amount of them. Uh, you know, they exist. They're there to be pulled out. Eventually, you're going to reach a point where they're harder and harder to pull out. And sooner or later, if you extract it all, it, it'll be basically all gone and consumed. And we can estimate what the future might look like. You know, I pulled this data from the uh, BP Statistical Review from 2012, where they gave total world coal and oil reserves of uh, 861 billion tons of coal and about uh, 1,503 billion barrels of oil. Now, one thing that we do know is that if um, the rates of extraction of these resources look like a typical bell-shaped uh, curve, and that the uh, the total amount of production over the uh, you know over history, starting from the point at which we first started extracting, it, has to equal the total of past production plus the total of in-ground reserves, as estimated by the BP Statistical Review, what we can do is extrapolate going forward what the production curve might look like. And I did this by fitting bell-shaped curves to past history of production, and I set the parameters of the bell-shaped curve so that the total area underneath is equal to the numbers that have been provided by the BP Statistical Review. Now, what's a little bit alarming uh, in this analysis is that it forecasts that peak fossil fuel energy is likely to happen sometime in the next decade. So we're at a point now where we're pulling a huge amount of energy out of the ground, but we're also at a point where we've extracted about half of the total available world reserves, which is the, uh, the point at which uh, you know, costs start going up. So we start seeing things like the BP Deepwater Horizon actually having to drill uh, you know, miles under the sea floor in order to extract oil. Uh, they're going after pockets of oil that have been uneconomic in the past, but now that the price is higher, uh, you know, the, these uh, sources of fossil energy are quite a bit more attractive to, to extract out of the ground. But we're reaching a point where the amount of energy uh, that has to be invested in order to uh, extract these resources is getting pretty close to exceeding the amount of energy that we can liberate from burning these fuels. And that's what's going to result in uh, you know, peak energy. And this has some, some profound implications if you just stop to think about it for a little while. What it means is that if the population keeps increasing, pretty soon we're going to be reaching a point at which uh, population is going to have access to energy, but the amount of energy available per person is actually going to start going down. And people are going to have to start competing for that energy. And the way that that energy is going to be rationed is probably through higher prices. Now, an important question that we have to ask is the prosperity that we've seen over the past couple centuries, has it been due to the abundance of fossil fuel? I personally believe that it is. And here's an interesting experiment where I overlaid the earnings of the S&P 500 companies uh, expressed on a, a per share basis over the, the trend in total extraction of fossil fuels worldwide. And if you sit if you sit here for a minute and actually compare these curves, you'll notice that they <laughs> track very, very closely. So I'd like to offer a hypothesis that the increase in earnings of the S&P 500 has been largely due to the abundance and cheapness of fossil fuels. And we will reach a time at which point, you know, the, the availability of the fossil fuels is going to start going down. And I'd like to ask you, what do you think is going to happen to the earnings of American corporations, world corporations. Yes, they, they probably will go up because they are expressed in terms of dollars. But in terms of real earnings, uh, you know, the ability of these companies to generate enough profit in order to uh, you know, sustain good lifestyles, 
um, I think that the, the real earnings are actually going to start stagnating and end up going down. So I'll ask you, you know, is the state of abundant energy going to persist indefinitely? I would argue that it's probably not likely to. And I'd argue that things are going to start getting tight over the next decade. And I'd also ask you, what are you going to do to secure your future? Are stocks going to be able to you know, put food on your table? How about bonds? What other resources do we know that track the price of energy and are likely to maintain their actual purchasing power relative to the cost of energy and the cost of living going forward? Think about that a little bit. I'd be interested in your responses and your debate. Thanks. Bye.